Hello and welcome. This is the Nutritionist Webinar. I am Marianne Fezenden from AMTS. Today we are joined by Dr. Trevor DeVries of the University of Guelph. Dr. DeVries is the Professor and Canada Research Chair in the Department of Animal Biosciences at the University of Guelph. Trevor received his BSc in Agriculture from the University of British Columbia, UBC, in 2001. Immediately following, he began graduate studies at UBC, where he received his PhD in 2006. Following that, he spent one year as a postdoctoral fellow with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. In 2007, he was appointed as faculty with the University of Guelph in the Department of Animal Biosciences. In that position, Trevor leads a highly productive research program focused on dairy cattle behavior, nutrition management, and welfare. His talk today will focus on nutritional management of cows milked with automated milking systems. Please remember to jot down any questions you have during the presentation and type them in the Q&A or chat windows. We'll start the questions after the presentation. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to be a part of this uh, webinar series and to be able to speak on this topic area of nutritional management for cows milked with automated or robotic milking systems. And it's a pleasure to speak on this topic area. Uh, what I'm going to hopefully share with you today is a collection of some of the research that I've been involved with and others looking at this topic of nutritional management of, of cows milked and robots. And specifically uh, with the idea of thinking of, of what is the role there and what are some of the challenges and opportunities that we have. Now, what makes nutritional management in, in robot uh, milking systems uh, unique is the fact that it plays an integral role uh, from a motivation standpoint uh, for getting cows to milk voluntarily in those systems. And so when we think of what motivates a dairy cow to milk in a robotic milking system, we often think of feed and, and specifically we think about the feed that is provided to the cows in the robot. And that's true, but we also know that it's beyond that. And so it's not just the feed that we provide in the robot, but it's also the feed that the cow gets at the feed bunk, the uh, PMR that those cows are consuming. And so it's the balance of those two that really drive that motivation of dairy cows to milk. And, and that's what creates success in robotic milking systems. So if I could give you kind of take homes right off the bat in this webinar here today, my, my keys to nutritional management in robotic uh, milking dairies would be to encourage voluntary visits. And so do that through nutritional management, specifically through the robot concentrate feed. And, and so that feed in itself um, should be formulated to fit the traffic system you're using. Uh, specifically, if we're using a free traffic system or a guided traffic system, uh, the feed should be palatable. Obviously, it's something that the cows want to eat. And, and part of that is also a, a, an ideally a, a quality pellet. And, and so we've seen mo much and most success in producers using a good quality pellet that is hard and doesn't break down and is gonna be eaten well by cows and, and, um, and, and very well received within the robot. At the same time, we wanna make sure that we have a PMR that is also gonna be consumed in high amounts and, and in a good manner. And part of that is, is a highly digestible diet with good quality forages, and I'll come back to that later in my presentation. And then also part of that is having good consistency in access and promoting good feeding behavior at the bunk because that's gonna also then translate into good milking visits in cows in, in robots as well. And so what I'd like to do is walk through these two kind of areas and talk about some of the challenges, talk about some of the opportunities that we have with both the, the concentrate in the robot as well as the feed that gets provided to cows in the bunk. Starting with the role of concentrate in the robot. And this is important again to think of is when we, when we consider robotic milking and when we consider why we provide concentrate at the robot, the first and foremost reason is really to act as an enticer for that cow, or as, as many put it, like a candy for that cow to get that cow motivated to go to the robot. Beyond that, we can think about and, and, and implement ways of meeting the individual 
nutritional needs of that cow. So thinking about ways of, of precision feeding that cow to her requirements, to her production requirements. But first and foremost, getting that cow into the robot, attracting her to that robot. Now, the amount of that is going to depend on a variety of factors. And, and part of that is, is the cow traffic system, which I alluded to uh, before. So we know that in a free traffic system, there's going to be a little bit more onus to get those cows into the robot. And so we tend to rely a little bit more heavily on that concentrate in those systems and the amount of that in those systems versus guided traffic systems where we can maybe get away with a little bit less as we also have other motivators for getting that cow to that robotic milking system. One of the questions that uh, comes to mind when we think about all this is what happens when we do alter that concentrate allowance at the robot? And this is a, a question that myself and others have looked at in a variety of controlled studies over the years, trying to see how the amount of feed that we provide to cows there influences her behavior at the robot as well as her total nutrient consumption. And what I'd like to do is share a series of studies that we've done, and these are studies that uh, have been done in collaboration uh, with Dr. Greg Penner from the University of Saskatchewan. And so between um, uh, them at the University of Saskatchewan, where they have a uh, research barn with a uh, robotic milking unit set up uh, for uh, feed first uh, in a guided traffic system. And, and in our system at the University of Guelph, where we also have a research barn with the same capabilities, where we have a robot, we also have indiv individual intakes on the cows that are milked therein, where, where our system is actually set up in a free traffic system. And we've been able to do a series of studies looking at this question of how does cow response and, and particularly nutrient intakes both at the robot as well as at the feed bunk change when we start to move the amounts or change the amounts of concentrate we provide there at the robot. And so one of the first studies that we did was this one done at the University of Saskatchewan looking at changing the amount of concentrate provided in this again in a guided system in a feed first guided type system where the cows were either provided a lower energy PMR or a higher energy PMR. And basically the difference in energy between those PMRs, we either provided in the robot or not those cows. And so those cows on the lower energy PMR uh, were allocated up to five kilograms of feed in the robot per day. Whereas those on the high energy PMR only got a half kilo of feed uh, maximum per day in the robot. And what was interesting to see is that when we did that and, and having basically an isocaloric type diet scenario, what we saw is that that difference in intake at the robot or provision of feed at the robot translated into a difference in PMR consumption. And so nearly a, a complete substitution by which those cows that got more feed at the robot were suddenly eating much less PMR compared to their counterparts who had a higher energy PMR and less feed at the robot. So that at the end of the day, the total amount of dry matter intake consumed was actually similar between those groups of cows. That was followed up by another study with a similar type design, in this case, a more of a dose response. So going from, again, a low allocation of feed at the robot, half a kilogram per day, all the way up to five kilograms per day, again in an isocaloric situation whereby we reduce the amount of energy provided um, in the PMR for those cows. And same thing as the previous study, what we see is a substitution effect by which as we add more grain to the robot and take that out of the PMR, we see those cows reduce their PMR consumption so that at the end of the day, the overall consumption level of the cows remains static. And so we see a very similar level of total dry matter consumption between any of those groups. That was followed up by one more study in that same uh, research station uh, with a feed first guided system, whereby this time, rather than looking at a, a static PM or a isochloric PMR, we looked at two different types of PMR. So a high forage and low forage and in this case, adding either two different levels of concentrate allocation to that. So 
cows either receiving up to six kilograms of feed in the robot per day or two kilograms of feed in that robot. And what was interesting is that regardless of the PMR that was provided to those cows, we still saw that same response whereby those cows on the higher concentrate allowance of the robot had a reduction in their PMR consumption such that at the end of the day, the total dry matter intake again was similar between those groups. So suggesting a pattern here as far as providing more feed in that robot, reducing PMR consumption and not actually changing the overall dry matter intake level of those cows. And, and I think that fits to the biology of the cows and, and that's probably a good news situation is that we know that the cows are gonna be typically limited by the total amount of dry matter intake that they can uh, consume. And so if we know that and we can predict that dry matter intake level, then we can then apportion that within the feed that we provide within the robot as well as the feed that we expect them to consume within the feed bunk. Now one of the things that we were interested in seeing was whether or not these same results carried over into a free traffic type scenario, which is uh, more popular within the industry and we see more farms with uh, free traffic uh, type setups. And, and so this is uh, the results of one of the first studies that we did using our research facilities at the University of Guelph, whereby we compared, um, again, similar to the first study I showed you, a, a lower energy PMR versus a higher energy PMR. And basically what we did is we took the grain out of the PMR on the high energy one and put that into the, uh, or sorry, into the lower energy and put that into the higher energy one and, and, and vice versa, either provided that to them in the robot or in, um, in, in uh, or, or outside of the robot, such that we had a six kilogram uh, allocation of grain to those cows in the robot or a three kilogram per day allocation of, of feed to those cows in the robot. And similar to the uh, previous studies that I described to you, what we saw is we saw this substitution effect by which those cows that had more grain available to them in the robot reduced their PMR consumption as opposed to those cows that had less grain available to them in the robot whereby those cows had a higher PMR consumption. Now what's interesting to note is that substitution of the concentrate uh, for the uh, PMR consumption was not as great uh, in this case, such that at the end of the day, what we actually observed in the, in the case of the study was that the total dry matter consumption level of those cows fed the lower energy PMR, higher allocation of the robot was actually higher, statistically higher uh, in this free traffic scenario. Similar to that, uh, we replicated this study once again, and this is some new results, uh, some unpublished work, uh, whereby we, we looked at the same feeding levels in the robot. So again, comparing a six kilogram per day versus a three kilogram per day allocation. But in this case, we kept the TMR static. And so we didn't change the energy content uh, of the uh, PMR that was provided to those cows. And in this case, what we saw, again, very similarly, we saw a difference in PMR consumption. And so by removing or having less um, feed available to those cows in the robot, we saw a slight increase in their dry matter intake level. But again, similar to the previous results that I shared from you with, from, within our research uh, station, what we saw is a uh, increase in, in dry matter intake. In this case, uh, statistically, it was a, a tendency for slightly greater dry matter intake on those cows with the higher robot allocation. And so what this tells us at the end of the day is that the response that we see to changing amounts of feed available to cows at the robot is gonna have variable responses on how much feed those cows consume at the feed bunk and potentially some of the production and, and milking responses that we see from those cows. One of the challenges is that, that even though we see that variability, we don't see a lot of consistency in the responses across all the studies that have been published. And so on the slide here, what we have is a table of most of the studies to date that report changes in concentrate allowance at the robot 
as well as at the same time measured how PMR consumption changed on an individual cow basis in response to those changes. And what we see is that the response is not consistent and it is not necessarily tied to the experimental uh, setting. So we're hopeful, hopeful that when we would look at this data that we'd see maybe some kind of um, consistency in response related to the average days of milk of the cows, maybe the experimental design, even the traffic system of the cows or the dietary strategy from, from the PMR standpoint. But we don't really see necessarily that kind of consistency there. What we do see is, is variation between responses where um, when we look at the substitution ratio, which is really how many kilograms of PMR consumption uh, reduction there is for every kilogram of extra feed there is in the robot. And so if this number is one, that means that for every extra kilogram of feed there is in the robot, the amount of uh, PMR consumption goes down by one kilogram. And so anything over one is actually a little bit of a concern for us because that indicates that those cows are actually eating less at the end of the day. So extra feed in the robot actually means less total dry matter intake. And the lower that number is, probably the better off uh, we are. And so if we're seeing numbers up down at, say, at that last study that I showed you, where it's only a half a kilogram, that means that the total amount of dry matter should actually be improved in, in those scenarios. From a production kind of response then, what's interesting to note is, again, not a uh, huge amount of consistency in uh, impact on cow performance. So again, looking across all these studies, we don't see a ton of consistency. We see uh, various studies where we see no differences um, as we add basically more concentrate to those cows or we allocate more concentrate to those cows in the robot. We see no difference, whereby we do see some studies with some positive effects, either more visits, more yield, or tendencies or uh, numeric differences uh, for those. What's interesting to note is that in those studies where we do see increases in yields, more visits or, or, or tendencies for those or numeric increases for those, is that if we go back to that previous table and we look at those studies specifically from a substitution ratio, those are the studies whereby we do not see huge amounts of substitution. And so what that's really telling us is that we need to focus on and think about, as I mentioned before, making sure that the total dry matter consumption levels of those cows remain steady. And so regardless of what we do at the robot, we need to make sure that, say, if, as we add more feed into that robot, that we're not having a negative impact on the total dry matter consumption level of those cows and it remains the same um, or ideally uh, goes up as we say feed to meet the needs of those cows. Just to show you a couple results from uh, the studies that, that we did at the University of Guelph. This was the first study just to show you some of the performance differences here. In this case here, what we observed was that those cows that were on the lower energy PMR, the higher robot allocation, so these cows were getting six kilograms of feed in the robot per day as opposed to those cows that were on the higher energy PMR getting three kilograms, those cows milked more frequently. So they had about a half um, or 0.5 more milking visits per day. They had fewer fetches to the robot per day and they had overall more total visits to the robot. And, and so um, fitting with uh, also uh, putting that together with a, a total increase in their drive and our consumption, we'd expect that energy to be going somewhere. What we observed was that there was no statistical difference in milk yield between those two groups of cows. However, a fair amount of variation and a numerical difference of about 1.5 kilogram. And so biologically, probably significant, statistically, no difference. In the second study that I described to you where we kept the PMR consistent, but just changed the amount of feed available in the robot, in this case, we did not observe any difference in milking frequency between those cows. Should be noted here though, that the cows were milking on average close to four times per day. And so probably at that level of, of milking frequency, we wouldn't expect to see uh, much difference between, between those groups. 
Same thing as far as fetches, so no difference for fetches and actually no difference in milking visits per day. But given again the difference in dry matter intake, and so we saw a tendency for more total dry matter intake in those cows on the higher robot allocation, we would expect that energy to be going somewhere. From a milk yield standpoint, again, no statistical difference, however, uh, numerically about 1.6 kilos. So, and so uh, likely uh, that energy was going to milk and, and, and uh, probably just not enough of a sample size there to, to pick up that difference. That's a summary of most of the controlled studies that we have kind of looking at these concentrate differences in the robot. Uh, it's interesting to point out that there have been some field studies of commercial farms, observational studies that have tried to look at this and, and notably uh, two uh, studies, one out of Wisconsin, uh, Trombley et al. 2016, where they looked actually at herds, uh, robot herds across North America. And in the case of that study, what they actually observed was that Again, this is an association type study that greater concentrated allocation at the robot was associated with reduced overall herd production. And in that study, those authors actually attributed that to uh, potential reduced forage quality. And so that comes back to the, the question of the, the quality of the PMR, suggesting that potentially maybe in areas where they weren't feeding as good quality P, uh, forages, that they were compensating for that by providing more feed in the robot. And, and that very well could be the case. And we know that again, forage quality is gonna drive uh, total dry matter intake. And so if we're limiting dry matter intake by, by forage quality, then we might be having a negative impact on production. Alternatively, in another study uh, that comes out of the Midwest, this is from uh, Minnesota, from herds uh, that were looked at in both Minnesota and Wisconsin, what they observed was that greater concentrate allocation was associated with greater production. Now, one of the challenges, again, with that type of study and some of the others that are similar out there is the fact that in robots, we typically feed cows on a feed table by which higher producing cows are also receiving more concentrate to meet their needs. And so we have to always interpret some of the results of those studies with a little bit of a grain of salt. And we still need to do some more work in terms of really picking that apart and, and understanding whether or not there is exact kind of optimal levels uh, of uh, concentrate provision in robots to, to meet the needs of those cows. Besides some challenges potentially with how much uh, feed we're giving in the robot and the effects that that might have on, on PMR consumption and overall nutrient consumption, one of the other challenges that we have with concentrate allocation is variation. And, and one of the things that we've observed is that as we provide more feed in the robot, we tend to see more variability in day-to-day -day concentrate provision. And so as I'll get into in a few moments, that's gonna be related to how the cow is actually getting that feed in the robot and, and some of the challenges around that. And just to show you some of that data, this is one of the studies I showed you earlier, just showing in this case here, this is the standard deviation in um, robot consumption uh, in these cows in these studies. And what you can see is that um, uh, the amount of day-to-day -day variation, so this is the standard deviation across the experimental period, we actually see no statistical difference for the PMR consumption, but we see a dramatic difference between the amount of day-to-day of, of -day variation for those cows fed either a high amount of feed in the robot versus low, whereby those cows getting uh, a high allocation of feed in the robot are experiencing or uh, seeing a lot more day-to-day -day variation in terms of how much feed they're actually getting allocated in that robot. And that we see the same response in, the, in that dose response experiment where we went from half a kilo to five kilograms of feed provision per day. And we basically see a linear increase there as well in terms of the amount of day-to-day -day variation in how much those cows are receiving in the robot. Those were the studies with guided systems. In our free traffic system, we actually see similar type thing. And so looking here in the middle, we see the amount of day-to-day -day variation in, in robot or AMS concentrate provided. And again, much more variation for those cows on the lower energy PMR, higher 
robot allocation. But what's interesting to point out in this study is that similar to the previous studies, we don't see an overall effect on PMR consumption. And so the day-to-day -day variation in PMR consumption is actually uh, statistically the same. And if we look at then total dry matter intake, we don't see any statistical difference in the day-to-day -day variation in that total dry matter intake. And same thing goes with the uh, follow-up study that we did where we saw very similarly on a higher, so in the red here, the higher AMS allocation. So cows getting six kilograms per day at the robot versus cows getting three kilograms per day. We see more day-to-day -day variation in terms of the concentrate allowance, but we don't see that same variation carrying over to the PMR or their total dry matter intake. Doesn't necessarily mean that the composition of the feed day-to-day -day isn't varying, and that could be a concern uh, depending on the amount of that variation, but total amount of dry matter intake day-to-day um, uh, -day, or that variability associated with that is not necessarily um, uh, any different. That begs the question, well, why might we be seeing that? And, and, and at the end of the day, one of the things that we have to think about and consider is the fact that just because we program a certain amount of feed to those cows in the robot doesn't necessarily mean that that feed actually gets delivered to the cows and doesn't necessarily mean that that feed actually gets consumed. And so a question that we have then is, can cows actually receive their daily allocation? And that's gonna depend on a variety of things. So that may include the milking frequency of the cows, the time since the last milking, the programmed amount that we give to the cows, the meal size and the maximum meal size that those cows can have of grain in the robot, as well as the dispensing rate and box time of those cows within the robot. And what I'd like to do is actually go through these and, and talk about some of the challenges that these impose on really allowing cows to get delivered the programmed amount that they're supposed to be getting in the robot and, and then uh, capping it off, talking about whether or not that actually gets consumed as well. And so the first thing actually to think about is, is the amount of time cows are actually spending in the robot, how much time they have available to eat the feed that was provided to them and how fast that feed's actually getting to them. And so what's interesting is that if you, if you think about how much time the cows are spending in the robot, say if it's five minutes, per milking seven minutes, nine minutes, or say 11 minutes. And we correlate that or look at that in, in relation to how fast that feed might get delivered to them. So we can change the dispensing rate, say of the grain to the cows and the robot, let's say 300, 400 or 500, 600 grams. What we see is that if we're at a fairly low dispensing rate of 300 grams per minute, and those cows are only milking so for five minutes, say in that robot, the maximum amount of grain that we can get to those cows is about 1.5 kilograms. Whereas obviously if we're dispensing it very quick and they're spending a lot of time there, we can have a lot of grain get delivered. The challenge we have is that the eating rate of the cows may not necessarily allow for that. And, and so even though we can program that dispensing rate to be 300 grams or more, when we look at actual consumption rates of cows and we actually look at the rate at which cows can consume grain, what we see is that typically cows consume grain at about 250 to 300 grams per minute. And so we can't really be pushing the dispensing rate that much higher because the cows just won't be able to keep up in terms of their total consumption during that time period. And if we look at say mean box time, uh, we know that most cows spend on average about seven minutes in, in the robot uh, at any given milking. And so if we're thinking about the mean box time of about seven minutes, and let's say the average cow is eating at about 300 grams per minute, plus or minus, we're probably looking at a, a maximum meal size somewhere uh, around two kilograms plus or minus. And uh, probably for some of maybe our faster eating cows, that's about two and a half kilograms. And so we're kind of boxed in here as far as how much feed we can actually get those cows uh, to eat at any given milking. And this really gets constrained by the fact that even though the average say maybe seven minutes of box time in that robot, many cows are spending less time there. And this is just an example. This is some data that uh, Dr. Greg Penner shared 
from their research center showing that there's a number of cows there with reasonable production making a fair amount of milk per milking and those cows are milking relatively fast so under six minutes per milking and so if we're down under six minutes per milking and those cows are only eating at say say they're eating even at the high end of uh, uh, 400 grams per minute those cows are going to be somewhere just under or around that two and a half kilogram maximum meal size and so we need to consider that when thinking about how much feed we can actually get into cows on a given day and so another way of looking at that then is to look at depending again on how often those cows are milking and how much feed we're targeting those cows to consume at the robot it's going to uh, alter how much that feed that should be offered uh, uh, on, a, on a per milking basis and again if our average milking frequency say is, is around three times per day which would be fairly say standard within the industry and and we're uh, targeting somewhere around six kilograms of offer, well, that, that seems okay because that's, that's about two kilograms per milking and that fits very well within what we'd kind of reasonably expect from cows. However, if we're pushing that kilograms up to say um, nine kilograms per day, then we're suddenly looking at about three kilograms per milking and it might be uh, a little bit more difficult for the average cow to kind of achieve that. Doesn't necessarily mean that some cows can, some will be able to, but the average cow might not be. And so if we impose that, say that maximum, let's say a maximum meal size of, of two kilograms per day, and we impose that on this system, suddenly if we impose a two and a half kilogram max, you'll see that the majority of those scenarios here, we have that maximum. And so that if we look at the end of the day, the maximum amount that we can offer per cow per day, we're capping out at, at uh, fairly kind of moderate or, or moderately to high concentrate allowances in the, in the robot. And so um, if again, we're, we're sitting in and around that three milkings per day, the, the maximum amount of feed on average that, that we should be providing in that robot is probably somewhere in that seven and a half kilograms uh, per cow per day basis. And, and it's gonna be very difficult for us to get above that level. Another thing that we've learned over the last number of years is that just because we uh, program a certain amount doesn't necessarily mean they hit that target. And again, that relates to the fact that, yeah, not all cows are going to milk at the same frequency every day. Um, and there's going to be variability in, in some of those milking frequencies. There's going to be variability in, in some of the um, uh, times between milkings. And as a result of that, we don't necessarily hit the targets that we impose on those cows. And, and, and what was observed in some of the early studies looking at robot feed allocation is that the targets weren't met. And, and, and that's uh, potentially because we weren't actually allocating enough to those cows. And so what we've done in, in our more recent studies is actually we've overshot the target consumption level to actually get those cows to uh, get to a level we want. And so let's say if we we're targeting five kilograms per day, we actually program in slightly uh, above that so that uh, given some of that variation that we've discussed, uh, the cows can actually get to that target level of consumption. And, and that's really the only way that we get to those targets is if we overshoot slightly the amount that we program for those cows. The other challenge that we get uh, is the fact that just because we deliver feed to cows doesn't necessarily mean that we know the cows consume it. And, and, and so that's something that's been described as well is the fact that just because a cow goes into a robot and she gets a certain amount of grain in that robot doesn't necessarily mean she's going to eat that. And what has been described, and this is some uh, data that was summarized by Alex Back and, and Victor Cabrera showing that as we get above say about six kilograms of concentrate allocation in the robot per day, the risk of there being refused concentrate goes up significantly. And that becomes a challenge because that feed that was refused uh, still gets counted as being allocated to that cow that was in the robot, but is technically actually available to the next cow that goes to the robot. And so we end up with kind of variation in what cows are eating relative to what we think they're eating. And some cows may be eating less and some cows may be eating more. And so if we look at that and the impacts of that for that individual cow, if that target robot concentrate is not consumed, 
the, the software, the, the, the robot software is going to tell us that maybe the target was met because it says it allocated so much feed to that cow, but that cow didn't actually eat that amount. And so from a precision feeding standpoint, uh, that becomes a challenge because then we end up with what we'd say is unpredictable outcomes. And the same thing goes for then the rest of the cows because the next cow that comes into the robot, maybe she eats the leftovers from that previous cow and then she gets allocated the feed that she was supposed to get. The software still only indicates that she received what she was supposed to get, but she actually ate more. And so at the end of the day for that cow, we also end up with the potential for unpredictable outcomes. So there are some challenges there and, 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 and we do have, however, some opportunities as well. And, and, and some of our challenges there are, are making sure that we are careful that we meet the nutrient requirements of cows at various stages of lactation. And, and, and again, there's, there's a whole bunch of things that, that come into play here one of the things that we know is that with feeding individual cows within the robot, we do have some opportunity to meet their individual needs from a precision feeding standpoint. And, and I've already talked about that to uh, some degree. Um, one of the things that we need to stress is the fact that those feed tables, so how much feed that we provide to those cows needs to be based on stage of lactation of those cows and the production level of those cows. And it has to also match then the predicted intake level of those cows so we can match that PMR consumption with their robot feed consumption as well. Probably one specific area where we have the most challenge or we've observed some potential challenge for this is for cows in early lactation. And one of the challenges that's been noted within the industry within um, at least one study as well as anecdotally is the fact that we may have more issues with negative energy balance in cows milked in robots in early lactation and, and specifically more subclinical ketosis. And so this is actually results from a study that I was involved with here at the University of Guelph, whereby uh, one of our grad students was interested in looking at risk factors for high milk BHB. And, and in the case of this study, what they did was looked at almost 800 herds in Ontario, Canada that were on milk recording and specifically looked at the ketosis uh, results from those milk tests, looking at the milk BHB levels. And what they found was that the odds of ketosis increased by nearly one and a half times for farms with a robot, as opposed to those uh, farms that were milking conventionally. And this is for uh, uh, multi parous cows on those farms. Now, what was interesting is that this study, in this study, uh, we did not specifically have, say, risk factors for that difference. Now, at the same time, we were actually conducting another cohort study looking at um, ketosis incidents on robotic farms in Ontario. And, and the results of that other study kind of shed some light on why we might be seeing some of these, um, uh, some of these differences or maybe increased risk of ketosis on uh, robot farms. And so this is uh, results of a study that we published a couple of years ago where we were looking at the incidence of ketosis in, in, in cows milked in robots on commercial robot farms. And so this uh, study had a sample of, of just over 600 cows, whereby about one third of those cows were diagnosed or, or were um, uh, measured for uh, uh, or had a positive ketosis measure in the first week of lactation uh, measured through blood BHB. And what was interesting was that those cows that were uh, diagnosed as having one or more tests with a, a blood BHB of a, above 1.2 millimoles per liter, as noted in the red line here, these were actually the higher producing cows during that early lactation period. And so those cows that were at higher production were the ones that were um, uh, more likely to have ketosis during that early uh, per, uh, postpartum period. And what's interesting is that that difference in milk production actually disappears after that kind of diagnosis period where that, those lines actually come together. 
what we noted, what was interesting in the study is that when we looked at, this was an observational study, when we looked at how much feed the cows were receiving in the robots on those farms, we actually saw no difference. And that's, uh, again, this was um, uh, purposive in a way because uh, across all these study farms that we looked at, the amount of feed provided to the cows in the robot in the early postpartum period was actually static. And so basically all cows were on a fixed feeding level with no variation in association with production level during that time period. And again, this is something that's commonly done within the industry. We see uh, some farms on, on fixed feeding programs out to 21 days, even some out to 60 days uh, with no variation in association with production level. The challenge then becomes is that we see a discrepancy in how much milk is actually getting produced relative to the amount of concentrate provided to those cows. And so what you see here is that those cows actually uh, that develop ketosis in the case of the study were producing a lot more milk per kilogram of concentrate provided to them in the robot. Now, the, the challenge with this is that if those cows were then not increasing their PMR consumption, which may be a challenge in early lactation, we know that uh, PMR and, and total uh, consumption does lag in that early postpartum period, then those cows may be, that might be the reason why those cows were at greater risk of going into negative energy balance during that time period. And so it becomes an interesting question for us is how much more provision may we need to provide those cows in early lactation to meet their requirements and, and whether or not we should be putting those cows on a feed table based on production already early in lactation to meet those needs. Now, again, one of the potential challenges and drawbacks with that is that there's always a concern of getting cows ramped up on grain too quickly, especially when we're providing grain separately from the, the PMR from a rumen health standpoint. And so we want to avoid, especially in that early postpartum period, we want to avoid any risk of, say, subacute rumen acidosis. And for that reason, there's been some interest in, in whether or not we should be looking at, say, additional or different types of supplementation for cows in early lactation, uh, specifically looking at things that may be uh, more gluconeogenic, so alternative energy uh, provision uh, other than starch sources that may help get those cows through that early postpartum period whereby their energy requirements may be higher. And so some in interest within the industry of um, things like providing glycerol, um, molasses, so uh, sugar or, or, or other gluconeogenic precursors that are going to uh, potentially meet the, meet the requirements of those cows. Now, again, not a lot of research in this area to, to speak of. We've done one study looking at molasses supplementation, and I thought I'd just share the results of that study. So this is a paper that's just uh, being published uh, as we speak. Uh, and, and in the case of the study, what we did is we either um, calved cows out, and this was done on commercial farms, whereby those cows either calved out, went straight onto their robot pellet, or they went onto their robot pellet plus some additional molasses, liquid molasses in the robot. And what we found was that in the case of the study, despite a overall high level of ketosis, and so we still observed high levels of subclinical ketosis, again, um, based off blood BHB testing, what we saw is that those cows that were supplemented with the molasses-based liquid feed had a reduced number of reoccurring positive tests. And so those cows that had high uh, tests, so at least three or more positive subclinical ketosis tests within the first few weeks of lactation, there was a reduction in those in terms of those cows that were on the liquid feed diet as opposed to those on the control diet. And so demonstrating some positive there as far as being able to maybe reduce some of that negative energy balance that we're seeing there. Obviously, that's not the whole story as we still see a lot of negative energy balance in these cows. And, and so we need to take a broader look at our uh, management practices around freshening and uh, more likely into the dry period and how those cows are uh, coming into lactation to minimize that risk of, of ketosis in, in these robot milk cows. 
For the last little bit of my webinar here today, what I would like to do is, is, is briefly talk about uh, the fact that we can also drive total nutrient intake and milk visits through PMR management. And it goes back to what I was mentioning off the uh, beginning of this webinar is the fact that it's not only the feed in the robot that's going to get those cows to the robot, but it's going to be the consumption patterns of the PMR. And, and, and those consumption patterns are actually going to also drive milking visits. And we can actually see that when we look at, say, the relative frequency distribution of milkings per day. And so this is some data from an older study of ours, uh, whereby we plotted the relative frequency distribution of milkings uh, averaged across many days and, and many cows uh, for a 24 hour period. And what you see is kind of a diurnal pattern here whereby there's peaks in milking activity. And so there's times of the day where we see more milkings than others. And, and what's interesting to note is that these peaks in milking activity also correspond then to uh, feeding activity that are going on and specifically PMR feeding activity. And, and in the case of this study here, the, the direct peaks uh, as noted here with these arrows are the times when feed was delivered, when the PMR was delivered. And so what we see just like in a conventional herd, when we deliver fresh feed, we see a response of those cows going to the feed bunk but at the same time, because those cows are up and on their feet, we also see a corresponding increase in the amount of milking visits at those times as well. And what's interesting to note is that even though this herd uh, did not push up feed very frequently, they only pushed up feed a few times per day, as noted with these green arrows, we also see some small responses there from a milking behavior standpoint as well. Uh, so suggesting that the feeding activity of these cows is having a big impact also on when those cows are getting to the robot. And from an efficiency standpoint, if I want to maximize the efficiency of my robots and, and, and the use of those robots, what I'd like to see is as frequent milkings as evenly distributed throughout a 24 hour period. And so I'd like to try to avoid as much of these peaks as possible and, and try to keep that line as flat as possible. And to do that, what I need to make sure is then that those cows are stimulated to access the feed bunk as frequently throughout the day and, and do that um, using the, the PMR that we're providing in the bunk and the management of that PMR. And so that raises the question then is how do we stimulate cows to access their PMR throughout the day? And um, in the interest of time, uh, I'm not gonna talk about this too extensively, but first and foremost, that comes back to the quality of that PMR, and that's something I mentioned off the top. Uh, we know that forage quality is, is king, and, and, and the reason for that is that forage quality is going to drive uh, how fast the feed gets digested in the rumen of the cow, so the digestibility of those forages is key. So high quality forages digested fast. The faster those forages are digested, obviously the faster that feed leaves the rumen, and that means that those cows can eat more. And, and for any cow, what that means is that the faster that cow digests her feed, the faster that feed leaves the rumen, the quicker that cow will return to eating. And so what we see is a positive impact then on the meal patterning of those cows, whereby better quality feed gets digested quicker, that results in a quicker return to eating, that results in more meals per day. And the more meals we see per day, the more time that cow's getting up on her feet and the more chance that we have of that cow then also voluntarily going to the milking robot and getting milked at those times. And so that uh, feed quality, that PMR quality is hugely important for that. At the same time, as I also mentioned, we also know from uh, research both in conventional as well as in robotic scenarios that one of the primary drivers is going to be also uh, from, a, from a management standpoint, the delivery of new feed. And so feeding frequency and the timing of that can play a role in getting cows to the bunk. And, and so we've also seen success with providing feed more often, specifically in farms where they've implemented, say, automated TMR mixing and delivery systems where we have frequent delivery throughout the day as a, a good stimulus for those cows to get up into the bunk. The one point I want to make, however, is that just because we provide feed frequently doesn't necessarily uh, guarantee that 
that feed is always there. And that's something we have to also make sure of. We need to avoid periods of time whereby say that bunk is empty or uh, that feed is not within reach. And so at the same time as making sure the feed gets to the cows frequently, we also need to make sure that that feed is present and available for those cows. And so feed push up becomes even more important in a robotic milking scenario as opposed to even a conventional milking scenario because what that ensures is that every time that that cow gets up and goes to the feed bunk that there is feed there. And so not necessarily a stimulus for them to eat. The real stimulus should actually be that cow being hungry physiologically, but then when that cow goes to the bunk that that feed is there and she's going to spend the time that she needs to there eating and then potentially also going to milk. And so again, for me, it doesn't matter how we do that. It just matters more that we do that frequently and it gets done consistently. And we see positive impacts and, and, and the positive impacts of that are even magnified in our robotic milking herds. And a good example of that is uh, a study that we did a few years back looking at commercial herds here in Canada, so 41 herds, whereby we actually saw an association between how often feed was being pushed up on those herds and the amount of time that cows were spending lying down. One would kind of expect, well, if you push up feed, maybe you'd see more bunk, up, more bunk attendance. And, and that actually response can be quite variable. But what was interesting is that we saw this association between how often feed was getting pushed up and how much time cows were spending lying down, suggesting that the more often the feed was getting pushed up, the less time cows had to spend standing around waiting for feed, wasting time basically, but they could actually devote that time to resting more. And, and what we saw was that on average, herds were pushing up feed about eight times per day. That ranged from two to 24 times per day. And across that range, every two extra feed pushups was 0.1 line um, hours duration extra, which doesn't sound like a lot, but across that range, that's about one hour of line difference between those herds that were pushing up feed infrequently versus very frequently. And that's a huge amount of time that we can capture as being beneficial for those cows. The other thing that push-up does is obviously it's going to help their, their time budget from that perspective, but it's also going to ensure that those cows aren't limited in their consumption. And, and that, that's been highlighted too in some studies. Uh, one study uh, that I alluded to earlier from, from the U.S. Midwest of 33 robot farms, uh, data coming out of Wisconsin and Minnesota, suggesting that uh, those herds that were using an automated feed pusher, robotic feed pusher, uh, were getting about... 4.9 kilos or almost 11 pounds more milk than those farms using a uh, manual feed push-up method. Now that's a huge difference and, and so when we see that we might think well uh, that's amazing and, 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 and that's a huge uh, uh, reason why we should be investing in, in automated feed push-up. Now again uh, I don't have a problem with automated feed pushers but what this data really tells me is not the fact that automated feed pushers are that great but rather that the farms that were pushing up feed manually were just not doing a good enough job. And, and likely in the case there, those farms were experiencing large extended periods of time with either an empty bunk or uh, insufficient feed access for their cows, potentially maybe over the nighttime period when there's, when there's no, no labor say available within the barn and we end up with cows actually being limited in their consumption. And so it shouldn't matter how we do it, it more matters that we do that frequency or, or we do that feed push up frequently and we um, make sure that those cows have continual access. And uh, some, some more recent data as well from, from Canada, from, uh, from one of my students on a survey study that we just completed. And so this is some preliminary data suggesting that across almost 200 farms, so 197 robot farms that we looked at, the mean frequency of feed push ups was actually quite high. So almost 13 feed push ups per day most of those farms actually using an automated uh, feed push-up system. Uh, but what we saw in this case is that even though the number of farms using automated uh, feed push-up systems was high, the mean number was high, we still saw a benefit of more feed push-ups. So for every extra five feed push-ups per day, we saw about 0.35 kilos or uh, uh, just under, uh, or just over three quarters of a pound of milk per day. And so again, the magnitude is not as great, but Again, suggesting that even if we're getting feed pushed up often, doing it even more often is, is likely gonna have positive impacts on those cows. 
So that gets me to the end of my webinar here today. Uh, uh, a couple take homes for you. If we're gonna ensure good nutritional management and robot herds, that's gonna involve two things. That's gonna involve the concentrate we provide at the robot. And, and so we need to make sure that we match the type and amount of that concentrate, obviously to the traffic system that we're using, the needs of the cows within that system. But at the same time, balancing that with making sure cows are encouraged to eat their PMR. And so that comes back to formulating highly digestible diets that are gonna be eaten um, uh, well and, and promote good eating behavior and, and making sure that that feed is always available, delivering and pushing up feed frequently, having a very significant impact, not only the consumption patterns of the cows, but also on the milking behavior of the cows in those systems as well. And so with that, I would like to thank uh, at this point the various funders of the research uh, of this work and, and, and without that, uh, their support, none of this uh, work could happen. And so thank you to, to all those listed here on the screen. And uh, with that, I hope to uh, be able to en entertain some questions and, and some discussion around this topic area with you here yet today. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent and timely webinar. Before we get to questions for Dr. DeVries, let me introduce our next webinar. Next month, we will be joined by Dr. Martin Traxler, the director of AgriLab in Mexico. Dr. Traxler was raised on a grain and beef feedlot in southern Minnesota. After completing his BS at the University of Minnesota, he served as interim extension agent until he enrolled at Cornell University for a master's degree in ruminant nutrition. He also completed his PhD at Cornell, focusing on lignin, its relation to NDF, and the CNCPS model. Whilst at Cornell, he met and married a fellow doctorate student. He and his wife moved to Mexico in 1997. There, he established AgriLab Mexico in Gomez Placido, Durango, in north central Mexico. In 2018, he and four colleagues formed Consultoria SDS LaTeX to provide advisory services in various aspects of the dairy enterprise covering the country of Mexico and portions of Central America. In addition to his laboratory and consulting work, Marty serves as the distributor for AMTS, providing sales and technical support in Mexico and Colombia. His talk next month will focus on heat stress in dairy cows. The, no the November scheduling is always complicated by the United States changing from daylight saving time to standard time. So next month, the webinar will be on November 5th at 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We strive to keep it consistent in Argentina, which does not change times depending on summer or winter. I also want to mention a short webinar series we will be holding on November 12th and December 10th, specifically focusing on dairy nutrition. Dr. Andreas Foscolos of the University of Thessaly in Greece will present two webinars at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time each day with questions and answers following the presentations. More details on those webinars will follow. As you know, these webinars take a lot of work and cooperation. The webinars are organized and produced by AMTS USA and Global. Our longtime collaborator is Paula Torillo of Athena, who hosts the webinar series as El Webinar del Nutricionista. She received support from Guillermo Lerman, Technal, Rock River Lab in Argentina, Biotur, and Conicar. She and Paula Alanis, her translator, joined us in the afternoon webinar this time. We also thank our AMTS distributors who serve as co-hosts. In Italy, Elena Bonfante of Dairy Innovations Italia joined us in the morning webinar with Bill Prokop from Dairy Innovations for co-hosting in the morning. We were also joined from China by Sean Lee in both the morning and afternoon webinars and Marcelo Hens Reynamos of the director of 3R Lab in Brazil. He joined us for the afternoon webinar. We were joined in the afternoon webinar by Marcos Neves Fierre of Universidade Federal de Lavras in Brazil. Marcos makes a point of sending thoughtful questions in the months he's unable to join, but we were lucky to have him this month. We thank our generous sponsors who make it possible for us to get great speakers and manage the program. 
Our gold sponsors are Arm & Hanner, Arm and Hammer Animal Health, makers of cattle feed ingredients that optimize dairy cow health, and the Canola Council of Canada. Learn more about feeding canola at canolamazing.com. Our silver sponsors are Ajinomoto Heartland, superior nutrition through amino acids, makers of Agipro L, Dairyland Laboratories, and Virtus, makers of Strata with EPA, DHA, Omega 3s, and Prequil with Omega 6s. Our bronze sponsors are Dairy One Forage Laboratory, Amino Max, Adiseo, Purdue Agribusiness, PMI, and Sorcloy. Each of these companies support education and research worldwide. We hope that you consider them in your formulation decisions. We'll now go to the questions from first the morning recording and later the afternoon recording. We had some technical difficulties in the morning recording, so we were not able to capture all the questions we missed about 45 minutes worth of questions. We apologize for that. We will append the morning question period with the afternoon question period. Well, um, just anecdotally, Sam on his third week indicated that he's, he's having a little, he's still playing around with the ration, but he's having a little bit of difficulty with the tail end animals, um, especially given that they, um, a couple of the herds that they got were not robot herds that they bought. So they bought three herds. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a challenge you're going to get. We actually just started an experiment last week here at the university, uh, putting cows on a robot who had never been on a robot before. And it included a mixture of um, uh, first lactation animals and older animals. And, and part of the idea of the, the experiment is actually to look at differences in cows as far as how they adapt to the robot. Uh, and, and difference in kind of individual behavioral differences, personality differences, so to speak, and how that may influence their, their ability to, to adapt to a robot. And, and it's amazing how, how much kind of individual variation there is in that. And, and um, especially when you're on a new startup, either moving your herd or like, like in maybe in Sam's case, moving, right, multiple herds together, that, that can be a big challenge there for sure. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, he was pleased. It was going surprisingly well. Um, question on, is, do you see an increase in ketosis? Is it in the free cow traffic or guided tra cow traffic? Is it, is there a difference? Um, I don't think like in, in our work where we quantified that, uh, we didn't have that information. Uh, so we couldn't look for those, that kind of risk factors. Um, I, I hope to be able to maybe answer that in, in our kind of the big study I was describing before where we've got 200 herds. Uh, one of the objectives of that work is to dive a little deeper into that risk. And so we, from those herds, we have a year's worth of uh, milk recording data from those cows, including all uh, first test milk BHB levels on those cows. And so one of our goals in, in that project is actually to be able to look at uh, risk factors for that and, and maybe um, it could be that, that the traffic system might have, uh, an, an impact there. Um, but I don't know if I would have a specific prediction per se. Um, uh, it again comes back to, well, and, and I mentioned that in my presentation, one is, is obviously, and that's, that holds regardless of, of milking system is, is dry cow management, uh, uh, and specifically, say, body condition management of cows. And, and, and then the other, the other side of that is, yeah, making sure, um, uh, yeah, that, that cows get off to a good start in terms of intake. And so anything that might limit those cows uh, from an intake standpoint or, 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 or even cause cyclicity in intake may be a challenge. And this is where uh, I, I would actually wonder in, in guided systems, especially with fresh cows that might, uh, might be a little bit more timid, whether or not we, we might actually see uh, um, a little bit more cyclicity in, in their intake and early lactation. And that, that could actually be problematic as well, especially if those cows are, um, yeah, maybe not feeling that great after calving and, and they're not as willing to kind of stand and queue up to the robot and, 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 and might get bullied away from, from a selection gate or something like that. So there is kind of, I would say, maybe some greater risks uh, in a guided system that way as well. Uh, do, you, do you have any comments about optimum rates of concentrate buildup in a robot for a freshly calved cow? 
Um, and, and when you mean rates, like the, the amount provided? Yeah, how, how quickly are you moving to what you want them to ultimately get, be getting a full, full amount? Yeah, and, and again, not, not a ton of science <laughs> to, to say here in a lot of different opinions. Um, where, where I've seen problems, and I alluded to this earlier, was when we wait too long to get them up to kind of our, our target. And so I, I, I believe we should always be kind of lead feeding those cows in early lactation as far as pushing uh, everybody to, or, or, or not pushing them, but basically giving them the opportunity to uh, obviously uh, get to a reasonable level of, of consumption in the robot and, and, and be able to peak well. Um, uh, where I've seen issues is where it takes too long to kind of get to that. And, and so in some farms, I've seen that take anywhere from three weeks out to like eight, nine weeks. Um, I'd rather see uh, uh, to, to ramp up that concentrate intake uh, up at, at around or up to about, say, two weeks in, into milk. So in the first two weeks, we can even first week and then two weeks, we can have a, have a fixed level. And then at, at two weeks, we basically have a minimum um, that we're, we're targeting. And, and uh, again, that's going to vary depending on, on, on farm, but let's say that's around say six kilos per day. And then, and then we're feeding uh, off of um, a production level uh, over and above that. So we, we get them onto a feed table after that prime point and, and we wrap them up uh, uh, based on, on production level. And, and, and we don't limit them either. We, we, we keep those uh, fairly liberal at that point as well. Okay, thank you. Um, how Do you have a recommendation on what the maximum amount of starch in a pellet would be? Um, so, yeah, again, a good question. And, and, and we've done a bit of digging as far as, uh, well, obviously in, in research as well as in the field, what we see. And, and yeah, it, it's, it's interesting to note that there's, there's uh, a lot of variation, like uh, products and, 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 and formulations that are out there on the low end are like 15, 16% starch. Uh, and I've seen pellets kind of uh, up to 30, 30, 35% starch. Um, and um, uh, I'd say a lot of kind of, a lot of them are coming in in that 20 to 25 um, uh, uh, percent range. And I don't necessarily uh, see the need to push that too high. Uh, again, depending on the levels of feed that we're, we're providing in the robots and, and the size of the meals that we're expecting on the cows, um, we, we could be getting into trouble when we're, when we're pushing kind of high starch, 30, 30% plus kind of pellets, um, uh, especially in early lactation uh, uh, in those cows. And so that's, that's one area where I think we got, we got to be careful um, from, from a, again, from a research standpoint, very, uh, very little out there on, on what's optimal. Uh, thank you. Uh, do you have um, research on the relationship of number of cows per robot on um, the relationship between visits, intake, and production? For example, 40 um, cows per robot versus 50 versus 60. Um, yeah, well, we have results from some field work where we've looked at uh, obviously across commercial farms, kind of what our average uh, stocking rates per milking box, and then the associated kind of effect on, um, uh, on production. And, and generally what we see is, um, uh, and, and our numbers in, in kind of our surveys of, of Canadian herds, our, our numbers have typically ranged between about, let's say, 45 to 50 cows per robot. Uh, some of the US numbers tend to be a, a little bit higher the average, typically just over 50 cows uh, uh, per robot in, in, in some of the studies that, that are out there. Um, and again, these are, these are averages. There's obviously people with, with higher rates. Uh, but generally what we see is that at 
kind of those stocking densities where we're, let's say in the 47 to 50 cows per robot, generally as we add more cows per robot, the, um, the, the production level per cow tends to come down a little bit and, and we don't see the incremental increase in production uh, on, on a per, per robotic unit as, as much as we'd like. And um, generally, I, I based again on, on kind of working with, with at least our Canadian numbers, um, our, our, our milk per robot really starts to uh, decline or, or, or doesn't basically increase as we get kind of probably above about 55 cows per, per robot. And, and, and we see the same thing, a negative, and that's production and, and visits are kind of the other way around, right? Whereas we, as we push higher, we, we see a, a linear decreases in, in, in visits as well. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. I've got, I think I'll do one more question. I still have some additional questions um, from my, uh, from, from Marcos in, in Brazil but we can bring them in on the, the evening webinar. Um, so discussing the importance of the Penn State shaker box numbers in PMR and robotic um, diets and the impact that will have on the robotic con concentrate consumption and how in, in essence does that affect cow health? Some of the previous studies didn't take it into account, and um, it seems like it would be a very important point. What are your comments? Um, yeah, again, uh, and I think the, the person posing the question is, is spot on as far as we, it's an area that we haven't looked into enough. And, and again, I'm not aware of anybody specifically looking at, and it goes back to the earlier question about, say, PENDF even, like looking at varying uh, chop lengths, uh, forage chop lengths, or, or looking at varying, uh, um, uh, PENDF. I would say at the end of the day, our, our, our guidelines in terms of the, the particle size distribution are, are probably, um, again, because these, because we're pulling some of the energy out, we, we would expect there to be uh, obviously, or these are typically a little bit higher forage diets than, than your TMR, and you'd expect the, the PENDF to be a little bit higher. Uh, but uh, similar to kind of our latest kind of recommendations for uh, TMR, we have to be careful that uh, we, we don't end up with a lot of sorting. And that's one thing we have done in our studies, at least, is look at sorting of these PMR, and, and we see especially when we have a lot of long forage materials in those um, PMR that we don't end up, uh, or we end up with a lot of sorting of those diets. And, and again, sorting uh, just results in similar to the uh, variation at the robot, which, you, which I talked about, uh, sorting even creates more variability in terms of what cows consume day in, day out and, and between cows. And so um, uh, we've seen success again, getting um, uh, kind of our longest forages chopped down well so that we don't end up with a whole lot of material, say on the top screen of, of that Penn State. Um, uh, just like we, we kind of targets now are less than 5% on the top in, in a TMR. I don't see why not, uh, why we shouldn't also uh, be doing the same in, in a PMR. Um, again, because anything bigger than that's just gonna get sorted now doesn't necessarily mean we chop it so fine that it's no longer physically effective. And, and so it can easily be uh, 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 pushing any of that material uh, on, onto the second screen there where it's still physically effective and, um, and, 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 and going to have a positive impact uh, uh, from, a, from a rumen health standpoint as well. Um, and, and again, yeah, the interaction, and I think that was part of the question, maybe the interaction with the, the robot concentrate. Um, uh, again, we, we've looked at kind of high, higher versus lower forage uh, a PMR. Um, 
those again in themselves can inf influence obviously intake levels of the PMR. No real direct uh, from from the work we've done uh, per se uh, direct kind of association with the um, concentrate consumption in the robot as far as affecting room and health goes. Um, but again, those were on studies where we're feeding kind of low, modest levels of concentrate in the robot. And so, um, obviously if, if we're pushing high levels of a high starchy concentrate in the robot, that's, that's where we could end up with some, some more room and health problems. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> you may have like almost tied the record on, on the length of webinar and questions with Tom from from last month. We had a lot of questions. And there's another one yet to come. So um, Trevor, we'll see you this evening. Everyone who's still here, thank you for attending. Okay, Trevor, we, we have many questions already. So the first question is from Jose. Is it a convenient to use flavoring additives in the concentrate? If so, which ones uh, do you recommend? Um, so yeah, the question, and can you hear me well? Yes, you're good. Okay. Yes, perfectly. Yes. Um, yeah, the, the question about use, use of flavor and um, Again, there's, there's been a little bit of work on that uh, in the past. And, and there is, I guess, some limited empirical evidence to suggest that, yeah, it, it, flavoring agents can obviously enhance the palatability of the feed. And, and so uh, at the end of the day, anything that's going to be added that's going to enhance palatability has the potential to in increase the attractiveness. Um, there hasn't been really a lot of good uh, kind of comparisons, at least publicly uh, made available data to, to show drastic differences between um, different products or, or, or flavors. Um, and so um, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to say, or, or to kind of prescribe one, one flavor over another. Um, uh, I would say that the majority of commercial products that are out there are, are incorporating some type of flavoring agent and, and probably for some, for, for good reason. Um, and, and again, uh, yeah, the, the types that are there are, are, are quite varied. Um, one that, yeah, you see, you see a few that are uh, kind of pop up or you see a little bit more popular, I guess, and um, including kind of, use of vanilla. Uh, that's one that I've seen a fair amount. Uh, also, um, uh, uh, fenugreek as well, uh, uh, um, uh, being reasonably popular as well within, uh, as a flavoring agent. Okay. Uh, and uh, the other question is related with that uh, is from Pedro. Is there any most palatable ingredient to promote the, the visit? Yeah. So as, as far as palatability goes, um, uh, it depends on, on, I guess, uh, which, yeah, when you're thinking of kind of the major ingredients within uh within say a pellet um uh, typically and, and there is again a, not a ton of research looking at this but again through kind of field experience and there is an older study looking at this um uh, wheat wheat products are are typically viewed as highly palatable um as well as there, there's some evidence that um uh, uh, you can get reasonable uh, palatability as well with with uh, um, uh, with oats uh, as well. Um, There's some, some some older work suggesting a kind of a, a barley wheat uh, or sorry a barley oat uh, mix uh, um, had positive effects on, on palatability. And so from from a grain perspective, those would definitely out outdo kind of any any corn based. Um, uh, concentrate 
from from a protein standpoint, and and that's again not not only in in um, uh, robot pellets, but we know that from calf studies, etc., that uh, soybean meal would be would be preferable to say or over canola meal from from a palatability standpoint. Um, and then there's other things that we would typically add in anyways for pelleting, including molasses, right? To, uh, which, which we know a cow is fine palatable, which is going to have a positive impact there. And, and, and uh, uh, some beet pulp as well uh, can, can have a positive uh, effect on the palatability as well. Uh, okay, and Leo wants to know, do you think the use of simple sugars may have the same effect of molasses, for example, lactose? Um, so that, I guess that's a good question. And, and potentially from a palatability standpoint, it, it may, right? Like it may have a, a positive impact there. Um, the, the benefit of, of molasses uh, typically is, is it also helps in, in kind of pellet binding and hardness, uh, right, and, and keeping pellets together. So that's probably some of the advantage there. Um, but, but there is definitely uh, opportunity there, probably with other sugar sources as well. Okay. Um, okay. Paula, yes. shall um, I ha see if Bill has some some questions or comments? Okay. All right. All right, I can jump in. Bill, you're very very quiet. Why? Oh, you mean you can't hear me? Right now, I can hear. Now you're sounding better. Okay, let's. That's uh, much better. Okay, so we'll go from there. Um, so, Trevor, getting back to the you know the systems approach to everything and trying to correct unintended consequences, it seems like one of the unintended consequences of robotic milking has been the challenge of components, specifically butter fat, or at least with the clients that I've, that have robots that I work with. Um, is that a, a fair statement before I continue or would you disagree? Um, <sighs> I guess in my experience, not necessarily. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and again, I think in our Canadian, and, and again, most of my experience is in our Canadian market and industry where um, we typically feed for uh, pretty good components, I would say. Um, and, and so just an example, um, we have uh, some new data coming from some benchmark data from uh, whole or from robot herds, and so 168 uh, robot herds here in Canada. Uh, average milk fat was 4.04, .04 and milk protein 3.4. So that tells you that we're not. What was the no, volume? What's that? What was the volume? 37.7 uh, average. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, okay, that would make sense. Yeah. yeah, so, right, and, and again, obviously, if we've got herds kicking out 40 to 45 kilos, they tend to have lower, right, and and we do, like, I think in that study, our highest herd was at 48 kilos, right, so the, those are there, but again, um, and again, you, you, you deal with individual herds that might be at that level of production, but when we look across the industry, um, and, and the U.S. numbers are quite similar, actually, and, and I haven't seen kind of aggregated data of herds, kind of uh, do survey type studies where we see average production over kind of 35 to 37 kilos, right? Now, now again, have your upper percentage of farms are going to be right in, in that 40 to 45 kilo range, but... Um, and yeah, to get that amount of milk with high components might be, yeah, it might be a little bit more a struggle. Depends a bit on, on I would say it comes back to then on those farms, how we're achieving that uh, from an energy standpoint and from a forage uh, um, digestibility standpoint. As well. well, exactly. I mean, it, it all is always going to get back to the forage digestibility ultimately. Um, but I guess what I'm wondering is, as you pointed out, we have introduced perhaps more variation of intake as we increase 
the amount of pellet that they're eating in the robot. And what I'm wondering is, given a lot of considerations, and, and a lot of this is contingent upon having a digestible PMR, you know, the basis of the diet, would we not be better off just using the robot feeding as an enticement, as you alluded to earlier, as the candy, so to speak, say beet pulp with sugar, at a small inclusion rate, just to get her in there and depend upon the PMR to do basically be a TMR with a, you know, a supplemental amount of soluble digestible fiber in the robot with molasses or whatever to get her in, in an amount that we know she can consume. Um, it's kind of, it's not unlike what we're doing with freestalls, you know, conventional freestall parlor situations in terms of feeding TMR. Uh, or has anyone looked into that? Or yeah. Because, Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, because it, it seems to me like the more we can do to re remove variation of intake, the better off we're going to be in terms of uh, achieving health, you know, well-being, performance, that that type of thing. Um, but uh, again, this is conjecture. I'm just yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There, there's in theory, it sounds good. Uh, but practically, we run into a, a, a bunch of issues, and 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 one is, um, um, and maybe more so in, in a free traffic system where we need to entice those cows into the robot regardless, right? And so, um, uh, and, and so the amounts there to keep them kind of occupied and happy needs to be. Uh, sufficiently high to 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 get them coming back because uh where where we do especially in a free traffic system where we do push those um or we push that pmr energy content up and nut total nutrient content up uh too high we start to see them really tailing off in visits or even if it was a super palatable thing at the robot their their real desire to the their desire to milk is just not strong enough, right? And so if, if the cow can satisfy her energy requirements at the bonk, then she'll stop coming to the robot, regardless of how sweet or whatever it is that we're get, getting in that robot. And so we need, to, we need to hold a little bit of that energy back to those cows to get them going there. Um, and then the other, and then that's, that's also true even, it's not only for our high production cows, but it's actually for our, our, our later lactation cows as well, because what happens too is if it's, again, that bunk mix is, 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 is too rich and we're not getting those cows still enticed to go to the robot, then, then they just start coming or they stop coming to the robot as well. And so we, we tend to see those cows dropping off the, so they're, they're, um, persistency is not as strong and, and we see those cows over conditioning pretty quickly as well. Um, and so that's, that becomes kind of that challenge there. And, and so I think, um, yeah, it, it's, it's always coming back to a balance, right? Um, and I think part of my point is that there is that potential for variation, but it doesn't necessarily mean we can't overcome it. It's, it's when we start getting really extreme, particularly on a whole herd level, as far as kind of um, uh, what we're say feeding in the robot, that's when we start to get into a bit more trouble. If we keep our kind of average uh, concentrate provision at the robot to more of a modest level, and then we feed to, to milk above and beyond that, then I, I don't necessarily think we, we have so many problems. What level holdback would you want to have then from the PMR to entice them in? Is there a, a, anyone quantitate that in terms of energy or, um, you know, NEL or, you know, what would we, what would we target? For, oh, so, um, well, in, in, in practically, and what, what I see in the industry that's that's working typically again and people have different strategies for doing this right and so some will formulate the the the, the ration as a whole and then basically say well i'm going to allocate probably on average this much out of the robot pull that out right right it's basically your pmr others will formulate the pmr for a certain level of milk relative to herd average right and so um but regardless of the way you do it 
usually at the end of the day, and, and again, there, there's, there's, there's some variation around this, but typically you end up with a PMR, like in, in that scenario, that's about 80% of, of, mm -hmm. of production of your, um, uh, of your herd average. And, and which equates to in, in kilos is typically between about seven to nine kilos difference, right? Yeah. Um, uh, from your herd average. And, and so that's kind of, that's a rule of thumb that a lot of people use as well, right? As kind of a starting point as well. Um, um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of where most, uh, most have kind of centered in on as kind of a sweet spot there. If you aim to overshoot the ration in order to achieve an actually higher intake. Um, do you have some indication of how many cows are getting closer to that target higher ration and the risks that might be involved in that, for example, acidosis? And so, yeah, again, I'm, I'm not totally clear on the question. I, I think what's being asked is um, when you overshoot the PMR, uh, yeah, I think, I think and, and cows eat uh, basically at, with, with the yeah. idea that they are over, like some of your high production cows are going to eat more than. Yes. Yes. What is your, how, how is your concern there? I believe that's what he's driving at and he can, he's still here. He can. I thought it was maybe in the parlor is what he was concerned about. Um, my interpretation. Yeah. Uh, Nico, if you, can can you clarify and um while while we're waiting on that clarification I'll, I'll move to the next question um so do you have any research as to the incidence of laminitis in robot herds versus standard tmr herds good question um so so we've looked at again um in a couple studies, actually, both uh, one, five, well, actually three studies. We have one, three published studies looking at, and, and not specifically uh, different hoof pathologies in cows, but diff but looking at lameness in, in uh, cows and in robot barns. And um, the interesting thing is that the numbers come back uh, fairly similar to our conventional um, our conventional systems, uh, as far as uh, prevalence rates of, of cows that are what we'd classify classify as as moderately uh, to severely lame. The probably the interesting thing is that the numbers of cows that are that are severely lame, kind of your your three legged kind of uh, um, limping cows. Uh, those ones are actually, you see fewer of those in robot barns. And I think that's because they're, they're even more painfully obvious to our, our robot producers. And they, those cows do get um, picked up maybe a little bit quicker. Uh, but we still see a lot of these kind of mildly lame cows. Um, uh, average uh, in, in the studies we've done even recently, probably about to, um, anywhere up to uh, about 25% on average with some herds obviously above and below that. And, and the interesting thing is a, a couple things is that the, the, the negative impact of that is even greater on, on say production than we would estimate in conventional herds. Cause a lot of studies looking at say lameness in, in even conventional herds, sometimes there's a quantitative milk loss associated with that. But sometimes the, the, the milk is actually washed because sometimes it's our, our higher producing cows that might be uh, at, at risk even uh, uh, or greater risk for lameness. Whereas in robots, the, the minute they show any kind of gait abnormality and foot problem, um, the, we don't, uh, or we see a negative effect because those cows start milking less. They become fetch cows more, or they're more likely to become a fetch cow. And, and so we actually see kind of a greater negative effect on their production. From, from a risk factor standpoint, uh, from the studies we've done, again, three kind of um, uh, studies uh, looking at commercial herds and, and, and uh, prevalence rates of lameness looking for risk factors. At the end of the day, the risk factors are, are this pretty well the same as what we see in, in uh, uh, conventional like parlor milk herds. And that's really 
things that are going to prevent cows from spending enough time lying down or, or causing cows to spend too much time um, on their feet. And, and so uh, stall design, right, having large enough uh, stalls, wide enough, long enough stalls, um, having, yeah, comfortable bedding, right? So uh, deep sand bedded barns having uh, far less lameness than uh, say uh, mattress based stalls and, and, and those kind of things. So um, uh, from a, from a nutritional standpoint, cause that's some people have thought that, well, maybe, uh, we're causing more kind of nutritional laminitis, which again is debatable even of, of what that is and, and how that comes about. But, um, we, we don't necessarily see that. And, and uh, again, I, I don't, I, I'm not aware of any research to really suggest that that might be something real in, in robot herds necessarily. Uh, okay. Uh, but can I, yeah. maybe I'll add something though, like, cause, cause the previous comment, and it goes back to that other question, I, I guess about rumen health and acidosis. Uh, th there are definitely herds and situations in robot herds where I, I have seen um, acidosis issues. And, and again, that that's could be related to a whole bunch of different things. And, and yeah, that, that could right uh, precipitate into, into hoof problems, uh, in those herds as well. Yeah, yes, I, I think that that's what that intent was. I do have clarification on that earlier question. So um, it's relating to the concentrate ration in the robot. So you mentioned that sometimes if farmers aim to feed less, if, to feed um, maybe five kilograms a cow, the variability okay. in milking frequency, box time, and dispense rate might mean that the cow actually only gets 3.5 kilograms. So one way to, for them to achieve the five kilograms is to overshoot the ration and allocate like seven kilograms. Yeah. So they would yeah. actually get the five kilograms was always your intention. But what if they actually are getting seven kilograms, which wasn't what you intended to have happen? What, how, how does that contribute to nutritional and metabol met metabolic and health yeah. issues? Yeah, yeah, and again, um, it's a good question. I, again, maybe I, I probably didn't explain it well enough while going through the, the webinar itself. And, uh, and so the, the example here is probably a little extreme, right, as far as um, uh, that much. If if we're if we're shooting for five and they're only getting three and a half, it's probably it's probably more than just some. Uh, there's something else that's causing that, right? Other than the, say the eating speed of the cow and even our milking interval. Um, typically, what we see when when we're so-called overshooting is that we're we're not overshooting more than maybe half a kilogram per cow per day, maybe up to a kilogram, but but even there. Um, generally probably half to three quarters of a kilogram of, of feed extra per day to, to get to that target. And so uh, for the most part, we don't see them massively overshooting, right? Um, uh, by, by, any, by any large amount. But even then, um, even in the example there, let's say they were given, and you, you'll have that too, because cows will have say rest feed, uh, if they say haven't gone to the robot enough and maybe they, maybe they have two kilograms of, of extra allocation. Well, the other thing that you have to remember is that that, that then gets distributed over the, 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 the following day's milkings. And so it might actually be um, over three milkings for, for that cow. And so then that extra grain, even in the grand scheme of things, isn't necessarily going to uh, have a huge negative impact on on their room and health, um, and that's something that we've kind of discovered as well. Is that in, in a lot of scenarios, when especially if we're feeding, uh, like if cows are eating even meal sizes of two two and a half uh, uh, kilograms of grain in the robot, there, there there's not a, a dramatic negative effect in terms of um, their uh, um, in terms of the room and health, because actually a meal like that is, is not that much different than uh, a meal of, of um, uh, say TMR with, with that's, that's say 50% concentrate. 
uh, on a dry matter basis. So, um, so it, it, again, as long as as long as those meals aren't extremely large, uh, then then we don't really see that huge negative as much of a huge negative effect. And I think actually more of our issues in acidosis in robot herds don't necessarily come from the concentrate in the robot, um, but actually come from uh, uh, irregular and, and slug feeding kind of patterns of PMR rather than, rather than the robot feed itself. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask one more question in relation to, um, and, and um, the person who asked that question says, thank you so much. I'm going to ask um, one more question in relation to the lameness. And then I have another question that I'll come back around to. And then it's probably time to give Paula an opportunity. Um, do you take, so the one regarding lameness, do you take into consideration the total lameness and the call rate in robot herds? For example, are cows called out of robot herds because they don't come to the robot and therefore the prevalence rates are skewed because these cows are, cows are called quicker out of the herd on robot herds? Um. Well, I think, yeah, and, and the the answer I gave before about um, lameness or, uh, suggesting that, and that's something we've observed, is we, we do see less of these really uh, um, uh, or less, l fewer severely lame cows, so very low percentages. And again, uh, I, I believe that is because those ca cows are either being identified quicker and treated and or called or euthanized from the herd, right? Depending on severity. So, um, so yeah, I think that does change that. But the interesting thing is the numbers of more mild lameness uh, or moderate lameness or clinical lameness, whatever you want to call that, um, those numbers are, are not that much different. So I don't think those are necessarily getting skewed. Okay, thank you. And then um, my final question before I let somebody, well, not my final one, I have many more, but <laughs> in this session, um, do you have any experience or opinion of how to best manage um, fresh cows in a case where a farmer has a conventional and a robot dairy to maximize intake and minimize um, NEB and any metabolic issues at the first 21 days after calving, would you put them straight after calving on the AMS or better manage them in the conventional dairy to control or monitor intake and health? Hmm. Uh, that sounds like a unique situation. Relative. It is, but are there, there, it is unique, but there are some uh, dairies that have played with this and that still kind of um, uh, work under this. Like I, I've heard of some larger dairies that yeah might milk their cows, uh, fresh cows say in in a parlor yet. Uh, make sure they kind of get off on a good foot and 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 then transition them onto the robot uh, at a certain point. Um, Again, I don't have a lot of experience in in that per se. I, my only my biggest concern with that is 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 then the point when we get those cows on the robot, and and I I can't I can't help but think that we're we're losing some opportunity on those cows because unless we're milking those cows again, uh, if we're putting them on a parlor, in my view, if we want to maximize. Uh, milk and cows, and we want to we want to get great peaks out of those cows in early lactation too. Then we better um, we we want to make sure that those cows are milking frequently in early lactation, and 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 more than just uh, uh, three times a day, right? So um, ideally, we have those cows in in the first few weeks of lactation, uh, getting up and 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 getting to to that robin. Uh, sorry, robot uh, um, four times a day at least, uh, and 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 maximizing um, um, uh, uh, mammary cell development in in that early lactation period. And so, 
Um, so we, we might miss out on an opportunity there of doing that. And, and then the other side of that is the training aspect too, especially with cows who've never been on the robot. Um, maybe for mature cows uh, who, who've previously been on them, but, but especially for a heifer, like it's going to be very difficult, right? To, uh, you, you would never do that with a heifer, kind of putting them on a parlor first and then switching them over. It's just the training would become uh, a bit of a nightmare in my opinion. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm going to turn over to Paula to ask some questions. And um, she's giving me a list of what her topics are. So she has <laughs> quite a few. Um, and then I do have, I have a, quite a list of questions as well. So um, Paula, are you ready with some? Yes, I'm ready. Um, I the 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 person who made a question about lactose wanted to clarify that he meant nutritional terms of lactose comparing to molasses um well, as far as comparing the nutritional value is that what Yes, yes. To compare the, the effects of molasses uh, with lactose. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, so then, yeah, so it's basically a comparison of, of yeah, um, lactose and, and sucrose, right, at the end of the day. Um, uh, I guess uh, molasses typically being high, right, high in, in sucrose. So, um, and again, I, I think, again, if you look at the data that's out there, um, you can achieve similar, right, uh, um, um, production. And, and there's some studies out there looking at uh, replacing, uh, well, replacing starch with, with either of those. And you see, um, you, you see similar, um, Um, performance based on those. Typically, the, the sucrose, uh, when, when we supplement sucrose, we see a little bit better performance, especially on, on rumen uh, digestion over, over lactose. But again, quantifying it, I'm not sure if I, yeah, I have those numbers in my head at this point. Okay, perfect. Okay, I, I have two questions uh, related to ketos ketosis. Yeah. Uh, if I supplement the concentrate with special additives and low rumen degradability um, bypass nutrients, may I reduce ketosis incidence? Um, well, I guess I guess there's a couple things there. Is is in in in. I, I hope I didn't in the webinar simplify it too much because the, the, the challenge with ketosis in any herd and, and robot herds is, is no different is that it's, it's more than just a early lactation energy uh, uh, problem, right? Feeding problem. And um, I think I should reiterate at this point that, and I think I did mention that in the webinar, but um, when, when we have ketosis issues, uh, it's generally a, a dry cow problem, right? And so cows that um, are not, um, are, yeah, uh, coming in over condition, maybe even drying off already over condition. And, and we do have a, a risk of that. And we kind of touched on that a little bit earlier too uh, in robot herds. And so first and foremost, our, our focus in, in robot herds, just like in a conventional herd, is making sure that we, yeah, dry those cows off at a good body condition, maintain good solid body condition through the through dry period and uh, ensure, again, um, uh, we're not putting on weight, we're, we're, we're maintaining good room and fill. And, and so that those cows then can, when they do make that point of transition onto their lactating diet, then they have kind of the tools they need to, to succeed. And then the, the point I was making and with some of the research as well that I showed is that 
we have to then make sure that we're not shortchanging those animals on energy in, in the first few weeks, particularly our, our high uh, production cows. And, and that's where uh, we have seen in the industry, again, it's, it's not in all cases, but we've seen in, in uh, some opportunity there where we are, or some challenges where we're holding some cows back because um, maybe they're, they're, they're just not eating enough PMR and they're not getting enough energy in their concentrate. And so that's where the idea of a, uh, a separate concentrate for those cows, which again, might not be as say starch uh, dense, um, but may have some other gluconeogenic precursors in there might be uh, desirable for those animals. I'm not sure you, you mentioned bypass nutrients. Uh, I'm not sure what, you, what you're referring to uh, specifically with that. But again, similar to um, like if there's additives that we're uh, potentially, yeah, targeting for our early lactation cows, that, that, that could be an opportunity there for that, right? Okay. Uh, I, I think the, the second question was answered because uh, uh, it said the cows with subclinical ketosis you showed us, uh, do you think they would have experienced the same health issues in a conventional mil milking system? Um, yeah, well, I guess, yeah, part, so partly I can answer that, like probably the, the primary risk factors would be the same for those animals. Um, and, and and, and so we need to kind of look back in time on those animals as far as, yeah, why are they, why are they even at a risk for ketosis? In a lot of cases, we see that because, yeah, they're, um, uh, yeah, they, they, they've either dried off to overconditioned or gained weight in, in the dry period. And then we go back in time, and this is where things get cyclical, right? Because then we realize, okay, those are cows that dried off late in lactation too because they didn't get pregnant early enough in the previous lactation. And so there's a bit of this snowball effect. And, and again, that's no different between conventional and, and um, uh, uh, robot scenarios. And so, uh, but then, yeah, then once they are onto milk, then yeah, they, the, the difference between uh, cows and a robot, there, there might be for a certain percentage of those cows, uh, the difference might be the, the kind of the nutritional program for those cows in, in early lactation. Okay, perfect. Uh, now I have two questions about grazing systems. The first one is, do you think the same effect of increasing concentrate is, is the same in situations of pasture instead of TMR, of PMR, sorry? Um. Again, I, I, I'll, I'll put, add a disclaimer here and that I, I have very little experience with working with uh, uh, grazing uh, uh, and robot scenarios. Um, and so my knowledge is kind of limited to what I've, I've read from, from others on, on this. Um, and again, in, in the grazing scenario, it probably comes back to, uh, again, the strategy there. Like if it's a, if it's a two-way or three-way type grazing scenario, uh, or, or even more so, um, uh, the, obviously the, the um, kind of grazing intensity that's expected there. And if it's purely grazing and feed in the robot, or if, or if there's also maybe a feed pad where, where additional feeds are being provided there as well. Um, and again, the, the the, the onus in, in the grazing, if it's a pure grazing scenario, the, the onus to um, go to the robot, it's, the, the cows are obviously going to be stimulated to go there based on the feed that's there, but they should also be kind of stimulated by, say, a depleted uh, paddock that they're in and, and the desire to, say, move on to, to uh, fresh pasture as well, right? So, um, uh, and, and so again, as far as the trade-off, and I think that's your question was getting at more is, do you think we'd see the same effects in terms of intake? I, I'm not really sure. Um, uh, just because I, I, I haven't uh, seen data and, and being able to work with data 
uh, related to that to, to kind of explore that. Okay, yes, I, I understand. Um, and the, the second question, in, in, in grazing robot systems, when you have to feed corn silage because of low pasture allowance, do you think it, it would be recommended feeding the silage before or after the AMS or next to the paddock? Um. Yeah, again, a, a good question, and and I think there's there's still, um, I, well, I, my understanding is, and actually the the one person who was asking questions there earlier, Nico Leons from from Australia, I think he has more experience yes. with this than myself, uh, and it, I think he even did a bunch of that that research himself, but. Again, there, there's still some debate out there, and that's probably why the question's being asked of what's uh, what's optimal from that front. Um, um, yeah, um, um, typically I think it's often fed afterwards, um, uh, but it might be, um, yeah, it, I, I would suggest, or what I've seen is that it's typically controlled also through kind of selection gates, right, for those cows, right? So depending on how close and ready they are for milking, uh, it may determine whether they go onto the, onto the feed or, or go into the robot, right, first. So um, again, that's kind of, without having a lot of firsthand experience with that, that's my understanding is that um, it, if, if the cow, again, can be set up if it could be set up that the cow can um, uh, come to a selection gate and if she's ready to be milked, be milked first rather than go to the feed pad. That that's uh, probably the 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 best way to have that set up. Uh, Trevor. Yeah. I asked Nico if it's okay, <laughs> and he, I'm gonna let him talk. So I'm gonna see how. Yeah, this that works. sounds good because he's got right. uh, he's got way more experience with this. Yeah. Um. So I'm gonna ask him to unmute and hopefully I've not ever done this. Good. It looks like, go ahead. Hi there. Excellent. We can hear you. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Trevor, for putting me on the spot there. Yeah. Um, so from the research we've done here in Australia, the recommendation is to feed um, access to supplements after milking. Um, not that we saw any difference in milk yield, but yes, in, in probably milking frequency and more importantly, in time spent on concrete, um, in the waiting yard and in the feed pad. So the reason why the recommendation is to feed access to supplements after milking is that you minimize the time cows spend on concrete and therefore the potential to affect um, feed problems or lameness on herds. And the other one is that you keep cows standing up after milking for a period of time that helps in like while the sphincter is closing after milking to minimize any potential other health issues. So the current recommendation is after milking, but um, complementing what Trevor said, the fact that you can manage gates um, allows you to have that flexibility of doing it before and after. And the only case that we've seen so far of using it before is when you might want to manage the pre-milking waiting yard, if it's too full, or if cows are not yet with milking permission, but are soon to receive milking permission, you can send them to a feed pad before milking, and then they kind of spend some time there and come back through the gate again and to the waiting yard, get milked and go back. Okay. Good, and that, yeah, that's, that's a lot more eloquent than the way. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this, I, this is when I love the webinars, when we get some good, um, good, good back and forth and good information. Um, Paula? Yes, excellent. May I? Thank you. He, he, will, <laughs> he will be with us in a conference uh, next week. Oh, nice. Lucky you. Yes. Good, yes. good. Um, Paula, do you mind if I ask a couple questions? No, go, go. Okay. I have more, uh, four more, but... I can wait. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I want to get to some of the questions that um, Marcos sent this um, for us to ask. 
You um, saved the tough, tough ones for last probably then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I realized like part the way through this, I should have just sent you these questions, <laughs> Trevor, so that you at least had, had some prepared answers. Um, a lot of the, his questions are with regards to pellets. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'll start off with um, one here that, that talks a little bit about corn silage and pellets. So um, where did that go? So do you think um, a free flow system with, that has a lot of pellets in the robot that's uh, receiving a fair amount of qu quantity would work well with a PMR that is heavily based on corn silage? Or does it need to be a low starch forage um, with large particle size to, to work well? Um, and this again comes to the acidosis and too much energy on the PMR would be issues on a high corn silage diet, do you think? Um, the, it, he asked because corn silage is cheaper and agronomically more efficient for a lot of farmers? Um, not necessarily. And again, it, it comes back to, it, it comes back to what that PMR uh, is, is formulated at as far as an energy, um, um, on an energy basis, right? And so, um, Often our, our in like in our scenario when we're feeding diets, our, our PMR, um, our PMRs are not actually formulated for say that much lower energy rate on on a on a um, mega cows per kilo basis than you'd think, right? So it's 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 it's. Uh, it's more about the predicted level of PMR consumption and, and then the predicted level of, of, uh, of obviously robot feed consumption and then the combined uh, total dry matter intake of those cows. Um, and so, yeah, again, if, 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 if the diet is, uh, and, and we have some fairly high corn silage diets here as well. Um, now, again, they're, they're, they're going to be, uh, they're going to have some other forages in them as well. Uh, so, um, but uh, I'd have to see kind of the specs on, on, on what uh, maybe the, the, uh, those PMRs would look like, but uh, I wouldn't be as concerned as long as, again, we get, um, yeah, good eating behavior of that uh, feed in the bunk, right? So that it's, it's, it's not being slug fed. The cows are getting up, going to the bunk often. Um, and then from a particle size standpoint, uh, yeah, it, it, it'll come back. I know we had some questions this morning about that and in, in, in a, in a TMR that's, um, uh, more typical of what we'd have here or PMR, sorry, where you'd have more of a kind of a half, half mix probably of corn silage and haylage, or maybe a little bit heavier on corn silage. Uh, in those cases, yeah, we, we, we tend to um, want to eliminate uh, as much of the really long particles as possible to eliminate sorting, but still keep that diet, say, uh, quite physically effective by, by maintaining a good average still particle size, uh, kind of a, on, on that second screen of say a shaker box. Um, and so corn silage would be kind of like a heavier corn silage, I, I would say would be, would be no different. We want to make sure again, that that's, it's not a sortable diet, but that we're still, we're not, it's not chopped too fine that, um, we're also, that we're losing physical effectiveness of, of it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I've got a, I've got a f couple flow questions. Um, could you comment on the location of water troughs to move cows in rotation around the barn in guided traffic systems? Um, it has worked really well to have the feed bunk separated from the water troughs by the resting area by one-way gates and an access to the other side done by automatic, automated separation gate. Do you know anything on water ingestion in such systems? Um, my short answer would be no. <laughs> um, and so 
And yeah, and I'm not clear on where they're suggesting the water would be. Yeah, can I comment? Yes, yes, thank you. Hi, Trevor. How are hey, you? Hey, Marcos, how are you? <laughs> We're hiding here, man. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, some people, they've been putting the water trout, in, like you had the feed bunk and the water trout in another place. And when they want to go from the resting area to the feeding area, they go to the separation gate. So they can get water only in one side of the barn. And it really, it, it really works well to make out rotating in, in guided, guided traffic rowboats. But uh, I'll say if they want the water, they want to go to the other side all the time. And they, they I think cows walk, walk more in the barn. It, it's good for the milking procedure, but really some people is afraid of doing it and not getting enough ingestion of water. Like, uh, because like a cow can't just eat, drink and eat again. She would need to eat, go to the other side, then come back to, to eat again. And they, they move too much. But milk yield has been high and, and yeah. it can really lower the concentrates in the, in the parlor. What yeah. I think it increased the chance of lowering costs. Like you can use high byproducts and other things on the PMR. It's all more. So, so, so are you suggesting that that's in a, like in a milk first type scenario, right? Yeah, it could be milk yeah. first or feed first. Yeah. yeah. But you put the, but you put the water. It, so the, one side. It, is the water is in the lying area. Yes. Usually. You yeah. Have a, you have, yeah. You have a feed bunk. There was then a, a one-way gate to the resting area, and yeah. the water is there. Water there as they, well, yeah. And when they come back to eat, they go to the separation gate. Like yeah, there. and I would wonder. I think it's hard to say what uh, again without studying it what the cows would do. Um, and again, the the thought there, the process there, and that's probably what you're seeing there is yeah, because the, 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 the cows are motivated to uh to drink right uh, um yeah. after milking and and uh, as well as during meals right so uh the problem is y you might actually you might see some kind of disruption of normal meal patterns um yeah this, some people they put water in just outside the the robot but they with a one-way gate also if they drink and they go to the feeding area but they don't they can't come back to the to the water again. Yeah, I like, yeah, and I, I still like again. That's one of my yeah. Um, I like to give the opportunity for cows to have a a a, a drinking bout during a meal because we actually when we yes. when we look at mm -hmm. meal patterning of TMR and PMR, we often see um, kind of if we look at intervals between kind of individual. Uh, uh, eating eating bouts within a meal mm -hmm. we see uh kind of a positive in, in or a break in intervals and it's typically corresponds to cows going away and having a drink right yeah, and that, so, that that's exactly the question and yeah I, and so i that's where i I'm a, I'm a little bit i would be a little bit concerned that you're actually you could potentially be having a negative impact on um on cows kind of eating to satiety and 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 also yeah kind of drinking enough during those meals to kind of satisfy that that desire now the the problem is and this is this is where you the reason why people have moved that away is because yeah when you do move it away then what the cows do like you said they'll they'll leave the feeding area then go have a drink and then they'll decide hey i still want to keep eating so then they'll go back through the selection gate and back to the feed bunk to eat. And so the artificially the passes might look like they're having a lot of meals, but it's actually probably the same meal. Yeah, but you, you have a lot of passes in the separation gate. So you basically don't need a lot of concentrate into the robot. Yeah. So yeah. That, that's, that's a good thing of it. Like some cows, they don't even eat there. It's like a normal TMR and you can, and I, uh, like you, you, you need to have a high producing herd. You can't have like yeah. low producing cows mixed with high producing cows. But yeah, it, the only challenge you get you get there is that yeah, if you do end up with um, yeah cows that uh, yeah 
yeah, decide they don't like going through the selection date or, or you have kind of your, like you said, your low end cows, your timid cows, right. Your fresh cows that um, the ones that you probably want to be going through often are probably the ones that aren't going to be going through as much as you'd like. Uh, you need to fetch. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So, so some cows. That's actually another question. What be a good fetching percentage for you? Like robots, they don't give us this number. Like voluntary milking versus non-voluntary milking. Yeah. But how, how can you get that in a farm? Do you have an idea? Like I think it's an important number because like the robots, they give us the milking speed cow, but they don't. They don't give the number. Uh, about who was fetched and who was not fetched like people write it down once per week or once yeah. per month or what are they doing do they know this number well, every time i ask this number they they say something but nobody really knows it and no. it's a pretty important one i think yeah it, it is an important number but i um i uh and, and there has been some surveys looking at that, right? So people making estimates of uh, kind of fetching frequency. And uh, generally, it, it's not a high um, uh, high percent, right? So uh, there has been, there ha again, there, there, there's been some, um, uh, some studies, uh, some survey studies where the rates uh, of fetch cows are like, uh, uh, 10 to 20 percent of cows, but that that's extraordinarily high. Uh, but on average, like say, I'd say good numbers are like five percent or, or kind of less, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, they've been talking about 15 percent. Yeah, I, I've seen people fetching 30 percent of the cow and they don't mind because they milk yeah. more. They, yeah, they, they do. For example, they they had a high producing herd, then they go into the robot and they don't want to lose milk the cow. Yeah. They would be milk, like they were. They were already milking three times per day, so they would, they, they would, fetch I, all the time. It's not voluntary milking. <laughs> that, that's the, but they don't mind because it pays for itself. You put one person there, you, you fetch the cow, they milk more, and it pays for itself. Yeah. So I, so I don't, I, I don't so have I, a rule for that. Yeah. <laughs> I may, I make an argument that like when, when I when I'm comparing even or thinking about comparing guided and free traffic systems. Uh, guided traffic systems generally, again, not necessarily always, but generally we see a few less fetch cows. Um, but, mm -hmm. but we also see some more negative effects on, on individual cows within the herd. And so from a cow kind of behavior comfort standpoint, I like the free traffic system from that perspective, but the, there is a greater risk of kind of negative farmer comfort because the farmer may have to fetch a few more cows there. But, but that's still related to, in my opinion, it's still related to overall management because in both scenarios I've seen when management is really good, feeding management is really good, the rations really good, everything, then we see very similar milking numbers and we see very similar fetching rates. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but again, like, like you're kind of alluding to, depending on your situation, the types of feeds you have available to you, that can have a pretty strong influence on that, right? So, mm -hmm. and I think that's probably some of the challenge there as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, uh, you're right. And, and there's another question. Do, do you, would you do anything different in a, like in a feed first versus a milk first guided system? Or nutrition would be exactly the same. Like, can we say nutrition for guided traffic and nutrition for free traffic? Like, you know, or if it's a feed first or milk first, it would matter. It so, right? Yeah, well, there is some different, uh, and I had some questions this morning about that. So, yeah, definitely between our free and, and our guided systems, we're well, yeah, completely different, I think. Yeah, I think, we'll, we'll have different approaches. For, uh, yeah, research for one should be different. From yeah, from the De other. definitely. But between the milk first and feed first, yeah. typically um, with with the with the feed first, we typically see the PMR uh, balance kind of close to herd average, right? Where we're still though feeding uh, some feed in the robot. Where where I've seen a lot more variation is actually in milk first scenarios, where 
I've seen either the um, kind of like what you were describing, the, the PMR balanced at herd or even above herd average, um, right? You really using that motivator for those cows to go through with very low levels of concentrate at the bunk or sorry, at the robot. Um, so, so the least kind of, so where, uh, but then on the other side, I've seen people still employing milk for scenarios where they're still feeding a TMR or PMR, sorry, that's uh, a little bit lower than herd average production and, and still providing three to five kilos of feed in, in, in the robot per day. So um, I'm not sure. And again, I don't know if we have good data to say what's the best approach. Okay, thank you. Go, Marion. Okay. Thank you, Marcos. <laughs> I, Thanks, Marcos. <laughs> Thanks, Trevor. I think that Paula has some more questions. Paula, take it away. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, Martin wants to know, uh, do you expect the same response if you fix the concentrate level and let the cow manage the level of PMR independently of days in milk and milk yield level? So, do they, yeah, do they, do they adjust their PMR consumption? And, and I guess it's not an easy answer because at the end of the day, um, cows are going to be limited in terms of their dry matter capacity. And, and so uh, that's something we have to keep in mind because um, the, just because we'll maybe feed less, a little bit less than the, like for a high production cow, peak lactation cow, um, let's say we kept the, the robot concentrate static. She'll, yeah, she may eat a bit more PMR, but that's gonna be capped at a point too where, where she's limited by capacity. And so then the, um, the, the energy density of that PMR then becomes important there as well. And so um, we can't just expect her to keep eating more and more PMR because uh, and, and, and that's where our, our intake predictions become very important. And our, our model, so our nutritional model that we're using uh, is hugely important for that because we need to have a really good grasp, uh, not only of kind of what our target herd average kind of intake is, but specifically through, throughout lactation, as we're building feed tables, we need to have uh, very good um, estimates of our, of our um, uh, dry matter intake so that we can we can then kind of figure out how to best build that PMR and allocate that feed in the robot to, to get to that kind of um, maximum uh, 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 feed consumption level. Um, and then again, realizing that there's, there's going to be some variability between cows. Some cows will or eat more than others. But the challenge with what was being suggested in the question is that again, coming back to say our, our later lactation cows, right? So um, the, the problem in the robot herds is we typically have cows across all stages of lactation there. And if we're doing that um, and that PMR is, is formulated at a high enough level that it's gonna be able to support uh, with kind of a low fixed level of concentrate in the robot and, and we don't have those cows on, on a feed table based on production, the challenge there is that then uh, that PMR is going to be probably too rich for those cows in later lactation and, and thus their, their desire to uh, milk is going to go down, their propensity to gain weight is going to go up and so we end up with challenges on that end and so that's why um, it, it becomes really tough to kind of manage that. Okay. Great. That makes sense. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I will make two questions in one. Uh, how about pellet size and the feed delivery number, recommended numbers? Um, so, um, I'll answer the first question. So, feed delivery. 
Um, and and you mean PMR delivery or? Yes, I think so. Yes. Okay. Um, so I would say again that the 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 frequency of feeding again is going to come back to obviously yeah what systems you have in place to do that and and um and uh yeah and 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 your ability to kind of manage that and so our research would suggest and i didn't spend a lot of time on that but our, our research suggests and this goes for pmr and tmr that that the, the primary stimulus for dairy cows to eat and and have a, a a reasonable size of PMR or PMR or TMR is going to be related to kind of new feed and new feed delivery. And that's when we typically see kind of larger meals. And, and so when we feed cows more often at the feed bunk, we, we see them um, kind of spread out their, their consumption more evenly or throughout the day. And so, so we can do that in a, in a robot scenario. And so if we see that with herds that are using say automated TMR systems where they're delivering six to eight times per day, um, we see that happening. And, and so that can have a really positive impact on spreading out that intake, not only maximizing intake across cows, but spreading out that intake so that we're also then getting cows to kind of pick and choose when they go to the feed bunk as well. And so that we don't have that slug effect on the feed bunk. And then the same thing with the robot, then you, you decrease kind of the pressure on the robot there uh, at the same time. Um, Again, uh, probably, and, and so that's important. The, the bigger, the other co component to that is, is making sure that we're not, um, uh, we're not uh, running out of feed or, or having that feed bunk kind of come down in, in, into basically very low levels of feed at any time point of the day. And so that, that again, is going to relate to the size of the, uh, the deliveries, the timing of those, and making sure that we're feeding for sufficient refusals. And then also the feed push up there becomes important as well. And so um, uh, in, in, in an optimal scenario, my, in my view, we're feeding often and then we're pushing up often at the same time. Now, again, if, if we, in the absence of an automated system, probably feeding uh, uh, twice or three times a day is gonna be better than once. Uh, but if we're limited in time and labor to say delivering feed once a day, uh, it is what it is, but then uh, we need to even be, uh, do a better job as far as making sure that that feed is, is, is um, uh, high quality. Um, it, uh, the silages are very stable and, and good, uh, especially in the summertime. And that we're also making sure that that feed's getting pushed up uh, often, uh, often and frequently throughout the day. Um, as far as the pellets go, um, the size of the pellets. Um, uh, again, I, I I'm not going to give numbers uh, just because um, I don't really have any any data to suggest that. Um, uh, one size of pellet uh, is, 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 is better than another in terms of, uh, uh, say, length or, or diameter. So um, I'm going to have to kind of um, uh, put that one off to the side and uh, just in, in absence of, of having any data either way or even, even, even kind of uh, practical experience with that. Okay. Th thank, thank you very much. I have the last one. <laughs> go for May it. May I, please? Yeah, go ahead. Go. Okay. If we achieve a high energy and or protein concentration, a low fiber concentrate, and if we allow the cow to eat four kilos instead of six, the substitution rate in the PMR would be that direct, as you mentioned? Uh, 
so yeah, so the question is whether or not the um, energy and, and protein concentration of the concentrate, uh, let's say if we fed a little bit less, but, but uh, say at the robot, but it was a bit more concentrated, whether or not we'd see the same substitution rate. And, and um, uh, my short answer is I'm not exactly 100% sure. And I would say that um, for whoever's asking that question, uh, hopefully we can answer that question in a few years. And, and um, I know a colleague of mine in Canada, Dr. Greg Penner, who, uh, a bunch of the work I presented today uh, was done in collaboration with him. That's a, a question that he's uh, particularly interested in and, and, and is hopefully going to be doing some work directly related to that. Um, again, it, it probably, again, in just reducing the amount total, and I'm totally speculating here, um, we, we, we might not see as much substitution, but again, if it's a bit more energy dense, then we might see a little bit more, right? So that's, uh, you won't see a one-to-one -one substitution, but it, but it, but it definitely, um, uh, will potentially, uh, be there still. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right, Paula, uh, <laughs> Paula, Bill, and Trevor, and Marcos. Um, I think that we are done with questions. <laughs> um, I, I, I knew thought you this, said Marianne this morning was the longest. Uh... I think you just, I, you, when I compile all this, <laughs> it's going to be very long. Um, I, I think it just speaks to the fact that, that robots are something um, that everybody's trying to wrap their head around how yeah. to best work and feed in that system and it's yeah it, yeah and if yeah if you don't mind me saying that too right like as a kind of a word on that like that's and that's some of our challenge right because a lot of what we're posed with in the industry right now is is an absence of a lot of data and we're trying we're trying to get data out there but uh the the challenge is that in absence of that, we have we're relying really on on experience, and and again, there's good experience out there, and I'm not going to deny that. But um, but the, but then the other challenge is that every situation is unique, right? So we used to think, right, like we kind of got things down with a TMR, and, and again, mm -hmm. the the concepts behind a TMR are, are pretty well universal. But then you get into a robot scenario, and it's more than just the feed and making sure the feed's there and fresh and all that. It's yeah, how much of it's in the robot and all these kind of things and the housing design and, and, and no two systems are the same. And that's where it becomes really challenging. So um, I think what uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll keep having questions for quite a while yet. And the problem is, I think like research is always in that, and I say this as a researcher, like, even though we try to research that's universally applicable, right? And we, mm -hmm we'd like to think that what we do is then transferable, um, uh, especially with robot research, it's very contextually specific, right? So, um, so yeah, what we find in one study, you have to really interpret uh, in terms of the, the overall conditions that it's being kind of conducted under and everything as well. And that's, again, those are the challenges. What? Well, again, Trevor, thank you so much. It's always wonderful to work with you. And thank you for everybody who attended and listened and um, hung in there. There's a lot of good, good questions. Paula. Thank um, you very much, Trevor. Yeah. Great webinar. Bill and, and Marcos, all of you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. you. Thank you, Trevor. Yes. Thank you, guys. Yep. Yeah. You're what makes good. this webinar useful. So again, everybody have a good evening. And um, what's left of it or, or day if it's in another part of the world. So thanks, everybody. Great. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Goodbye. Good night. Good night.